Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. In today's video, I want to talk about the Beast of Revelation. Um, there has been a lot of speculation over the identity of the Beast with the seven heads who comes up out of the sea. Um, and so I want to try to clarify and put this in its historical context and try to explain in my understanding and in, I would argue, uh, a large majority of some of the giants of the faith and their understanding who the beast of Revelation actually is. So when we look at Revelation, I think the first thing we need to do is start in chapter 1. Because chapter 1 sets up the context of how we are to understand and read the book of Revelation. In verse 1, we read these words, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So right in this, the first three verses of Revelation, we have clear time indicators. These things were written to John to show his servants what must soon take place, because the time is near. And so right there, we need to start questioning the idea that this book is speaking of events that are entirely future. And the reason we need to question that and why I would deem that to be absolutely impossible is because if it was future, completely future, it has zero relevance to the seven churches that John is writing to. He's writing to historic churches that were historically in Asia Minor at the time of this writing. And so this letter went to them, they were to read it, and if you are a member of, say, the Church of Philadelphia, and you read this letter, and it says these things are about things that are soon to take place, the time is near, and then is reiterated at the end in Revelation chapter 22, we see that John is told not to seal the words of the prophecy of the book because the time is near. If you're reading this book as an early Christian in the first century, and you read these words, you're going to read as though these events are going to take place soon. That they are soon, because Revelation says they are soon, not 2,000 plus years in the future. We can also recognize the context of this because in the book of Daniel, Daniel is told to seal the words of his prophecy. Seal them, Daniel, because the time isn't yet. Now it's very interesting because much of what Daniel prophesied came to pass within only a couple hundred years from the time of writing. And yet Revelation, John has said, not to seal the words of his prophecy, because the time is near, and yet we're going to assume that near means 2,000 plus years in the future? Or that soon means 2,000 plus years in the future? No, the problem is that most people approach the book of Revelation, they don't understand its literary genre of prophecy and apocalyptic, and so they see all these v very extreme images, and they go, well, Stars haven't fallen from the sky yet. They're still up there, so this book hasn't happened yet. And I would just argue that that is just an overly literalistic reading of ancient text and ancient genre of apocalyptic literature. And it's not taking into account the fact that these images, while they do represent something literal, the images themselves are not the literal depictions. They are symbols to symbolize or to signify, as John is told in Revelation chapter 1, the angel made known, the word there means signify. The angel signified to John, signified to John, the things that were to take place. So we need to recognize the book of Revelation is a book full of symbols. And these symbols must be understood as symbols in order to uncover the actual literal um, thing that these symbols represent. So when we arrive at Revelation chapter 13, we need to recognize the context says that these are events that are soon to take place, the time is near, and that's going to be communicated by symbols. So there's a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on his horns, and blasphemous names on his head. The beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet was like a bear's, its mouth was like a lion, and the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against him? 
And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, into captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Who is this great beast? Well, the natural understanding of the text is that the beast represents Rome. The beast is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, of course, had authority over every tongue, nation, tribe within the Oikomene, or the inhabited earth at the time. And so clearly the description we're given is of Rome. In Revelation chapter 17, we see the beast again, and the beast is said to be a seven-headed beast, and the seven heads represent seven hills. Rome was called, in ancient literature, the city of seven hills. So the clear identification of the beast is Rome. However, within this Roman power, there are seven heads, and the seven heads are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is. If we go down the line of Caesars, starting with Julius, when we get to the sixth, the one who is... That would be Nero Caesar. And Nero Caesar was a horrible, horrible beast of a man who persecuted the church for, you guessed it, 42 months. And so the, the evidence is very compelling that Nero is the beast. Um, he's the one of the heads of the beast, and the beast corporately is the Roman Empire. Furthermore, we get further clarity to this when we arrive and read about the second beast, the second beast is rising out of the earth. It has two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And it causes all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now this is very interesting. We see the second beast, which I believe is the Jewish Sanhedrin the priesthood of Israel. We see the first beast comes out of the sea. The sea in scripture typically represents the Gentile nations. And we see this other beast rising who's a land beast, comes from the land. And the land is typically used or, or earth is used to describe the land of Israel. So I believe that one beast is from the Gentiles, Rome, and then the other is from within um, the people of God, which is the Jewish Sanhedrin, the priesthood of the Jews. And I believe that there's compelling evidence to speak of all these signs and the beast worshiping the beast and the image of the beast is ultimately um, through the means of the temple. The temple, which was once a holy place after the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, was being used repeatedly to offer sacrifices. But these sacrifices were ultimately for Rome because... If you remember the words of the priesthood, as they stood before Pilate, they said, we have no king but Caesar. Right there, that is a picture of what I believe the mark of the beast is. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But this idea that, that there's this image of the beast, the image of the beast is ultimately the temple. They, they gave life to Rome by offering sacrifices and worshiping the beast through their attitudes and actions. We see the harlot, which I believe is Jerusalem, who sits on the back of the beast and rides on the beast. Jerusalem leaned into Rome's political authority 
to make, uh, to persecute the Christians. Um, and they used that authority all the time. And it wasn't until 70 AD that that authority was squashed. But this is interesting. Verse 18, we see a call for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. Now let me ask you, if this mark of the beast is in our future, why would John tell the audience that he wrote this to, that if they have wisdom, they can calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man? The number of a man. Seems to me that John is expressing to his audience that they can know in their, per, in their current context who the beast is. And what's very interesting is when you take 666, in both the Greek and Hebrew alphabet, each letter also had a numerical value. So when you would take this and you would add 666 up, if you take it in Hebrew and add it up, it comes to the name Neron Kaiser, which is the Hebrew pronunciation for Nero Caesar. So Neron Kaiser, 666. And in some manuscripts, we even see a change to 616, which some people thought was just a mistranslation, but it would all ultimately makes sense if Nero was the beast because this numerical switch would help the spelling to represent his name a little bit more uh, easily recognizable than Neron Kaiser. And so some people will argue that that's further proof. But here we go. We have the beast, which is Rome. We have the one beast that is persecuting for 42 months, Nero persecuted for 42 months. We have 666, which adds up to Neron Kaiser, and we have the, the picture in Revelation 17 that five have fallen, one is, we go down the line of Caesars and we end up with Nero. I think that the evidence is very overwhelming, and I've just touched it, this is just a summary video, that the beast is Nero. And the mark is not a literal mark. The mark is emperor worship, and we know this because in Deuteronomy, let me get to Deuteronomy here, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, where is it? So when we arrive at Deuteronomy chapter 6, we read these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So what is this command? The command is to love God above everything. Nothing takes priority over God. And listen to what he tells them to do with this law. This law to love and serve only him. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So here we have a command to serve and honor God as supreme, and to bind this on the hands and on the forehead. And when we see this mark of the beast, the mark of the beast is on the forehead and on the hand. And the mark symbolizes loyalty, allegiance. And so when that Sanhedrin, when the people came before and they said, we have no king but Caesar, they marked themselves with the mark of the beast rather than the mark of God, loving and serving the Lord their God with all their heart. So that's all I got for you today, um, but I hope that this is compelling. I think it's compelling evidence that the beast is Nero, um, and I hope to maybe do some more in-depth stuff at some point soon. Thanks for watching.